People have traded in their families to have a career. Their marriages, it's insane. Or even families. And this one I know is hard uh, because there's a lot of people, they're so devoted to their family more than they are even eternity so that all of their decisions is based on what's best for their family and not in obedience to what God's telling you to do. You know, when God told us to come to Minneapolis, it wasn't what was best for our family, but it was what God told us to do. And we were devoted to what he told us to do, not, not because it was great for our kids. And you know what's amazing? It ended up being great for our kids. But if we had made the decision based on at that moment, in that scope of time, what we thought was best, we would have missed what was best obedience is what God's called us to. And, and this is the amazing thing. A lot of times we put our family over God. It's true. We, we put those, and can I tell you, your kids are not yours. When I discovered that, they are his. They're his kids. So, I'm a steward of what he has given to me in these children, but I am not the one to tell them what God wants to do. And I'm not there. God, they're God's kids. So I need to stop trying to control the decision of my children. They're 33. Some of them are 60, and you're still trying to control your decision of your kids. <laughs> right? Do you, you know what I'm talking about? You, you have to let, you got to teach them to hear from the Lord so that they can be obedient to what God's telling them to do, not what you're telling them to do. And then there's money on top of that. You know, a lot of, a lot of people live for money, and they think money is going to give them happiness, so they're devoted to making lots of money, and it's all about money. And I want you to hear me this morning. Some of you, you have to be real. You don't think this is true, but you're devoted to making more money. It's all about money, and, and God, that's a gifting God will use you in to make money because some people are just good at making money, but make no mistake about it, money is not going to make you happy. There's a story Jesus tells, or, or is told in the New Testament, Jesus had with this rich, young ruler. He was rich, he was young, and he had power. Now, that's an anomaly, just being young and rich. Right? How many young people like it? There is a people like that. There is. Somebody's young and rich, you know, and has power and all of those things. And he comes to Jesus, and this is what he says. This is what he says about, uh, about this in Matthew chapter 19, 16. He says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He says, I have everything, but I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. I, you know, I've, everything that you, we search for, I have it, and I'm not fulfilled. And isn't that true for all, for all of us? We see, we see all of these people that have power, money, position, and they're youth, and they're beautiful, and they pretend that they're all great, but that's what's out in front of the curtain. You don't see behind the curtain until they commit suicide or tell you about their drug addiction or how bad everything is because they've hidden it all behind the curtain, and you've been pursuing everything they pursued, thinking that was going to give you what you saw what was perceived on the front of the platform when behind it was just depressing and miserable. This young ruler comes, he says, what must I do to have eternal life? Eternal life. You know, there's a U2 song that, that says this. It goes, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And if you read the lyrics to this song, it even talks how there's a search. And, and there was, it was written in this period of time where they said they were searching. Did you know they were a Christian band? That U2 was a Christian band searching for all of it. And even the end of the song talks about how there was deliverance and free in that song. But I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Because in the reality, all of us are searching. Every one of us are searching for something that will, one, make us happy, fulfilled, that will accomplish what it is we want to accomplish. And you think of Olympian athletes. They are not always the most gifted athletically. Did you know that? That there are actually Olympic athletes, gold medal winners, that even were not the most athletic in their sport. 
Because it takes more than athletic ability to succeed in the sport. It takes devotion. It takes being the person that devotes yourself to it, that you put other things aside. When all your friends are going out and having fun, you say, you know, that's great. I would love to come with you, but I have to put more time into this. I want to be, they're devoted to it. I need to make the most of what athletic, I've been. and those are the ones who win in the race because they learn to devote themselves to what they wanted to be good at. Hmm. So you get what you're devoted to. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 says, Do you not know that those who run in a race uh, all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may attain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it, uh, to, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. This is an interesting truth when you look at this. Because I think there's a lot of Christians that are only serving the Lord for a perishable crown on earth. They want blessing here. I want healing here. I want, I want the promises fulfilled here. I want all of it here. Like, I want it here, right here and now. Like, all, I'm living to get all of this stuff for right now. I want all the blessing now. I want all the, all the resource now. I want it all right here. Because isn't this what it's all about? It's all right here. This is what it's all about. And we have been so deceived, we have learned to live for the here and now. And we don't even think about eternity. We don't even, we don't even consider eternity. But the reality is we all die. We're all going to die, and then comes eternity. What I have here is a, is a rope. And it's a long rope. It's actually not quite long enough. Um, but I want you in, in, to envision that this rope goes on and 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 on. Okay? It's, it's actually about 50 feet long, I think. And... Uh, and um, what I want you to think is this rope is your timeline. This is your existence. Okay? The Bible says you were created to really be et eternal. So every single person, whether you believe in Christ or not, are going to exist forever and ever. And this blue, t this blue tape is your life on earth. I want you to take a look at that because we've been taught to live for the blue tape. And our existence is going to spend way more time in the rope. Fact, what's interesting is not only have we been taught to live for the blue tape, we've been taught to sacrifice and to focus on an even smaller part of the blue tape right there called retirement. And to spend all of this time saving up for something that we may not even get to. And when we make decisions that impact eternity, people say we're stupid and crazy. You're stupid to do that. You're crazy to do that. To spend an eternity, that's just the dumbest thing in the world. And I look at that and I say, so you're telling me that it is dumb for me to live for that rope and that existence, and I should be living for this? I ain't the crazy one. You are. That's the reality. We're living this life. Like the Bible says that what we do in the blue tape, what we do in the blue, will impact eternity. The decisions we make here, that's why when we came to Christ, Jesus said, you're living forever. I'm giving you the reality and the understanding that there is an eternity. How do I know? Because God sent his son to tell us it existed. And again and again and again, he says, don't be like the world and live for the blue. The blue is for eternity. But we want God to do everything. For God, will you do this in the blue? Will you take? I don't understand why God didn't do this for the blue. Because God's not focused on your blue. He's focused on your eternity. 
And he wants you and I to be focused on the same thing. But I would be willing to bet that most believers don't ever think about eternity when making the decisions in their life. They don't think about the eternity when their neighbor is there at their table and they have an opportunity to preach to them the good news. They don't think about eternity. They think about the blue. Because, see, inside of us, there's this intense need for certain things. There's, an, there's like an innate drive in us for things. Like, one, there's this drive in us to be accepted. So we don't do stuff that makes us look foolish because we don't want to be rejected. We want to be accepted. So we make decisions based on whether or not if I do that, I'll be accepted or not, right? So I'm not raising my hands in church because they may think I'm weird and I want to be accepted. That, that's just a, just a simple thing. But there are many other things that you may do. The other one is we don't want to physically die, so we do whatever it is we can to keep from dying. And I would say the power to that belief, that drive in us, is the lack of understanding eternity, I'm going to live for this right here. There was a, a master who had a number of servants. And uh, he, he had one servant, though, that he, everything he gave to this servant, he wouldn't do anything. Like, this servant just failed at it all. Like, he couldn't figure it out. He wasn't very smart. He just didn't get it together. And one day, the master was so frustrated with the servant because he had failed in the task he was given, that he reached down and he picked up a stick and he said, here, just hold the stick. And, don't, and all you have to do with the stick is when you find someone more foolish than you, you give them the stick. Well, this master was, was, you know, he was, you know, the servant was very faithful with his job. He slept with his stick. He went, everywhere he went, he carried the stick. He took it very, very seriously. In fact, he, every, he was so known by the stick, they started calling him the stick man. Right? Now, this story this is not a true story. It's not the stick man in Lakeville. For all those people who are thinking that right now, that's not who I'm talking about, okay? And this man had, uh, he was like the stick man, and wherever he went, he had the stick. Well, time had passed, and the master had grown in age, and he was getting ready to die, and he's like, I need to tell all of my servants about me dying and what's going to happen. And so he, all the servants came to him, and, and uh, he told them what was taking place. Well, eventually, the stick man servant came to him, and he knew he, he's so foolish that he's not going to understand death, so I need to explain it a little differently. And the servant came in, and he said, listen, I'm going on a long journey, and I won't be back. And the stick man goes, what? Oh, my goodness, you're going to be gone? Well, where are you going? He goes, I don't know. He goes, you don't know where you're going? He goes, no, then how do you know what to take with you? And he goes, I, I don't know what I'm going to take with me. Prob probably nothing, but I, I don't know. And he goes, well, if you're not taking anything with you, have you at least, do you at least know who the king is and the place where you're going to know if he'll be a good king or a bad king? He goes, no, I, I don't know if there is a king in the place where I'm going. I, I, I just don't know anything about where I'm going. He's like, master, how long have you known you're going on this journey? He goes, I reckon my whole life I knew this journey was taking place. And the stick man looked at him, thought for a while. He said, I think you may need this stick. <laughs> Should I be giving you the stick? Should I be giving you the stick? We want to ignore it, but I reckon our whole life We've known the day is coming when we're going into eternity. Do you know where you're going? Do you know what you're taking with? Do you know who the king is and where you're going? Because you've had your whole life to think about it and prepare for it. This whole blue thing. We get so caught up when things don't happen the way we think they should happen in the blue when in reality, it's all for eternity. It's all in eternity. 
What's your perception of death? When you're, living, when you're living for eternity, people living for this world are going to think the decisions you make are being stupid, but they're not. It's because God's given you a revelation of what is true. It is a fool. It is a fool that does not live for eternity and spends all that they have on what is passing away. All their time, all their energy, all their resources. The grand deception causes us to make decisions that lead us to use everything we are and have for a momentary existence. And then it's gone. The Bible says life is like a mist. That, that this life is like a mist. And then it's gone. What are you living for? What are you devoted to? What are you putting your money, your time, your talents, your energy, your days into? And how will that impact this? How will it play into that? We need to be devoted to an internal perspective. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of sound mind. But aren't we living in a culture right now that is so fear-based that it tries to use fear to manipulate every one of your decisions and actions? How many things are you investing your time and energy in based on fear? That the reason you made that decision wasn't because it was wise, was because it was based on fear. A sound mind is when our thinking keeps its eternal perspective, when we realize that this too shall pass because eternity will last forever. Some glad morning, when this life is over, I'm going to fly away. Do you believe that? If we believe it, don't we live with that in our mind? Do you know why we we're, you know why you feel if you feel this way so uncertain about everything is because you've lost perspective of eternity. And and I'll show you this in a moment, but in John 14, 1 through 12, it says this do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now you know the rest of this verse because everyone in here is only allowed in here if you read your Bible. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Some of you are thinking. How did I get in? <laughs> I don't even have a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, you talk to Zach. We will get you a nice Bible, okay? You need a Bible. But, but the, the reality is, is you read your Bible. You know how that verse, if you've read it, you know that verse, how it ends. Well, if, if we were to stop right there and you never read it before, you might say, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. You may say the next part of that verse is, now let's come together and pray together and ask God to do a miracle in this situation. Let's see if God will do something in this situation in our life. But that's not how the verse goes. Look at how the verse goes in John 14. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so... Would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare? What? What? He says, listen, there's all kinds of troubles, but what should encourage you is there's another part of the rope. Eternity. Have an eternal perspective to know this too shall pass. Will there be miracles that happen? No one's going to pray more for miracles to take place than I am because I believe God died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross to give us victory, right? But the reality is when someone dies, I don't get, I don't get disappointed. My, I get more encouraged because I know this is where they're at. I'm going to tell you, eternity is the great equalizer because when we get there, we're going to be like to live is Christ, but to die, it's gain. To live on this earth, see, see, that should have been a huge amen. But that thing in us that's driving to survive here doesn't ever want to say amen to that because we, we're afraid God might take that seriously. 
and I'm going to get some report and go home to eternity because we're convinced that the manufactured heaven we've created on this planet is better than the one created forever and ever and ever. Do you really think man can create anything better than what God has? Every believer needs to be devoted to an internal perspective. Soren Kierkegaard, and, and Kierkegaard, I, I think I said his name right. Sorry, Soren. I apologize. When the, he said this, when the sailor is out on the sea and everything is changing around him, as the waves continually being born and dying. So do you see this? A wave is born and then it dies. That's what he's referring to. He does not stare into the depths of these since they vary. There's all kinds of variables. There's all kinds of waves all around us. He's saying he doesn't stare. The sailor doesn't stare into the waves to make his decision. He looks up at the stars. And why? Because they're faithful. As they stand now, they stood for patriarchs and will stand for coming generations. By what means then does he conquer changing conditions? Through the eternal. By means of the eternal, one can conquer the future because the eternal is the foundation of the future. You don't look at what's coming and going. You look at what's been there ever since. Eternity has been there. Year after year after year, people enter eternity. That's what is the compass. That's the true north of our life is the fact that we will spend an eternity with Jesus Christ. And no matter how bad the waves are in your life, can I tell you this one truth? 94% of the world would trade places you in your worst situation. They'd rather deal with what you're dealing with than to watch their kids starve to death and they can do nothing about it. We get all caught up in the variable of all of it. Here's the first thing we need to do. The first thing we need to do is focus my eyes on the eternity, not on earth. I need to focus my eyes on eternity. Luke 21, 28 says it this way. He says, when these things begin to take place, stand up, lift your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Look up. And he's talking about all of this, the drought and the wars, rumors, roars, the earthquakes, storms, all of those things. When they come, he says, what do you do? Don't get caught up and frustrated and fear and, and, and get afraid. He says, look up. Why? Because he's there yesterday, today, and forever. It's not, it is not the economy that is paying for my life, taking care of me. It's not the economy that does that. It's not a president. It isn't a government it's the one who's been there before I ever existed and will be there long after I exist. Into my eternity. Not right here. He's my Jehovah Jireh. You know, when Stephen's being stoned, he's preaching to these people and they stone him. And it says that Stephen, while he's being stoned, what did he do in the midst of pain? Could you imagine being stoned? And I, I don't mean, if, if I were in California, you'd be thinking, man, at least he got some relief from the stone, you know, the pain. No, <laughs> no, N not that kind of stoning, like rock, rock stoning, okay? <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so, so he's being stoned, and you know what, it, what he did is he looked up. And while he's being stoned, it was eternity that was, he says, I see the Lord. And he forgave the people killing him because he saw eternity. And he's like, I'm going to live this small moment in the blue and receive the reward here. I'm going to live this for this. I don't want it in the blue. I want it for there. Revelation 12, 11 says this. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now look at this. They did not love their... Okay, read it with me. Everyone in here, read it with me. They of their lives so much as to shrink from... I'll do anything to survive to stay in the blue. When God has an eternity, he goes, I know the plans I have for you. And you know what we think that promise is for? 
right here only. I'd rather think it's for there because this comes to an end all too quickly. I'd rather think his plans for me go into eternity forever and ever and ever and ever. Here's the second one. Focus my life on the unseen and not the seen. I'm going to focus my life on the unseen and not the seen. We tend to live for what we can see, and what I can see is the blue. So I'm living for this. Now, I understand. Father, right now, I, 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 Lord, I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear in order to completely understand what is true and what has been so rooted in lies in our heart and mind, I pray in Jesus' name. You know, the reason I'm asking the Holy Spirit to do this is because it, everything in our environment tells us to live for this, what we see. Everything. That we cannot even comprehend eternity because we have nothing to compare it to. And our whole church experience really exists between the bookmarks of the baby dedication and the death dedication. Everything in Christianity is all about the blue. When we were, we were in Mexico last week and we were there with um, about 200 pastors from around the country, about 25 from Minnesota. So I don't remember who it was who was talking about this, but they were talking about a pastor who is a well-known pastor, and he's getting ready to die. And right before he died, he spoke one last time, and he said, if there's one thing I wish I had talked about more, and I didn't, was heaven. And, th and that's where it ended. So I looked it up, and I found the, the part where he said, and he said, and the reason I, only, I never really did was because it was very hard for people to grasp the eternal, especially when they didn't want to. Isn't that true? In order to fully comprehend what I'm saying, you have to want to understand it. But a lot of us want to ignore it because I'm not married yet, and I hope God doesn't come back before I get married, and we all know why that is. Or I want kids or grandkids, and I hope I don't, because we truly believe that the blue is better than eternity. And we're convinced of it. Second Corinthians 4 says, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not despair, per persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus must, uh, may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. The, the reality is that we could die at any time, and that isn't God not fulfilling his promise to us because his promise is eternity. Now, if you come to me, I'm going to believe that your pro his promise to you is to keep you here because misery loves company. I want you with me. I want us serving together. I believe God died on the cross, and I can ask for that. I believe with it all my heart. But if for some reason you were to die, let me tell you something. You did not lose the promise of Christ. You stepped into it the moment you entered eternity. But if you're not devoted to it, hmm. Look, look at this. It goes on. It says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Right here. What is it talking about? We don't fix our eyes on the blue. And all the stuff that's happening to me in the blue and all the troubles that I'm going through and are new, I fix my eyes on eternity. But that's like a, like pastor, like, like that's an old person message you're preaching right now. Are you kidding me? 
Do you, should you stink and wait until you're 70 to figure out that this is not an old person's message, this is yours? If you figure this out when you're 80, 70 years old, it's too late. It's too late. Goes on in Matthew, you will never be able to live. You will never be able to live until you're no longer afraid to die. And we're living in a point in time right now where everyone's afraid of death. Our culture is constantly talking about stay away, separate, because you might die. Can I tell you my life is not in the hands of a virus, but the hands of a large God? That it is appointed unto man when he dies and I'm going to stand in his word and not the word of the world. And I don't fault them in thinking that way. I don't fault them in the way they talk because it should be fearful if you don't know about eternity. If you don't know what's ahead, you should be very afraid. But for those who know that this blue is not what it's all about, that it's really about the rest of the rope, we're not afraid. We're not freaking out. Look at Matthew 6, 19 through 21. And I want you to see this. Jesus says that again and again he talks about eternity. He says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves. Live your blue for eternity. Why? Because they can't come and steal your treasure in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, is your treasure here? Because if it is, your heart's there. Or is your treasure here? Is, this your, is your treasure in eternity? Because if it is, your heart's there. And where your heart is, there your home is. Where your heart is, there is your home. It's when your heart is in eternity that you make this statement that Paul said, I'm just passing through. Yeah, that didn't work out, but I'm just a passing through. There's a joke that I heard a long time ago, and, and I... And, and I, I've told it, like, when I get to a point of retirement, and I doubt I ever will, but I'm going to put a snowblower in the back of my pickup, and I'm going to drive south. And when someone says, what's that thing in the back of your pickup? I'm going to be like, I'm home. <laughs> How many are going to join me on that one? All right. You know, I'm going to put sin in the back of my truck, and when they say, what is that? I'm going to like, I know. I'm going to put sickness and disease. In the when I drive, I'm going to get to eternity. It ain't going to exist there. They're going to be like, what is that? Eternity is the place without anything that has destroyed this world. Why am I clinging on to living here more than living there? Now, I'm not saying we should go out and kill ourselves. And that's what Satan would do is to make you think what I'm saying is we should all commit mass suicide. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. My life is in his hands, but I'm not going to live it for the blue. I'm going to live it for the rest of the rope. Here's the last one. Focus our hearts on faith and not on fear. We need to focus our hearts on faith, not in fear. Psalms 34, 4 says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Psalms 119.81 says, My soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. You know, I came across uh, this thing written by um, C.S. Lewis. And uh, I thought it was interesting. And, and we make this statement all the time that what we're going through is unprecedented. We don't, but people do, right? How many have heard it? We are in unprecedented times. Can I just say, no, we're not. No, we're not. And C.S. Lewis said this best. Back in the 1940s, who, who were born in the, who lived in the 1940s? Anyone in here lived in the 1940s? You're like, man, you look great. 
Let me just say, you were born in the late 1940s? Early 1940s. So you'd been a young lady when this was happening. Remember what it was like when the atomic age came, right? I've only seen it on History Channel when they showed the big mushroom cloud, when the atomic bomb was dropped, and everybody's freaking out, and, and kids are running under desks, and, you know, everybody's worried about what the atomic age is going to bring. And C.S. Lewis writes this way, from way back then, and look at what he says. This is incredible. Wherever you see atomic age or atomic bond, I want you to think coronavirus. Okay? Did everyone get that? Shake your head. I got it. Okay. Look at this. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. Did you make the switch in your mind? I mean, we got a whole news network covering it. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year? Or as you would have lived in a Viking age when razors from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed as you're already living in the age of cancer, the age of syphilis, or the age of perilous, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. <laughs> oh, this is so good. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was invented. invented. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors' anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have had one more chance of painful mature de premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances in which death itself was not a chance at all but a certainty. <laughs> oh, this is good. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. Pull yourself together, man. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends, and a game of darts. Not huddled together like frightened sheep thinking about bombs. Bomb, 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 bombs. <laughs> They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our mind. Are you thinking about eternity? Are you busy thinking about this life and all of the stuff in this life? Are you going to think about what's beyond death? Some of us spend most of our time trying to figure out the origin of life when you should be thinking about the destination after life because you were created to be eternal. You know, what's interesting is the reason so many things on this planet doesn't make sense is because you're trying to look at them with an eternal mind but in a limited fashion because you were created to think eternally. But everything you see ends. So you have a hard time understanding that you're telling me it never ends? That's right. And there's a reason Jesus said, I want you to store up. Because, and, and I'm not going to get to it today, but there's this, this idea that We, we're kind of socialistic in our heaven. We think everyone gets the same reward. So as long as I get in, we're all going to get rations in heaven. It's not true. In fact, Jesus said, look at First John. I'm going to give you this. I'm not going to get into all of it, but I want you to see this. I've preached on this before. If you look at, if you look in, 
in uh, 2 John 1, 8, it says this, look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a, which means there's a partial reward and a no reward. That how we live this blue is going to affect a whole lot in how we live in eternity. That there is something beyond this. That it isn't just existing in eternity and we all get the same thing. And God, like literally, there's something that Jesus was talking about when he said, there's a full reward and I want you to get it. But you need to run like a runner to win. Because there ain't anybody walking into eternity. Will you stand? I, I fully know, even while I was writing this message, you know, and, it, and a lot of times when I write a message, I'm hoping like the Holy Spirit just like opens it up. But I realized while I was writing this, this is one of those messages that you preach once and people leave going, I don't know. I don't know that that made a whole lot of sense to me because we have been so indoctrinated into focusing on what we can see that we really struggle to not, when we don't understand something, we ignore it. Have you noticed that? When you don't get something, there are some people that are going to go figure, but a lot of, there are a lot of people that say, I don't get it, so I'm just going to ignore it. I don't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to understand it. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But everyone in here, God wants you to understand the fact that we live in, we're going to live in eternity and we need to start being devoted to it. We need to store up for ourselves treasures in eternity. Why? Because he told us to. Because it's important. Because there's something about it. And there may be someone you're not even devoted. Like you're devoted to this life and having fun in this life. And this whole church thing, you're only here because... because because somebody made you come or because you did something you felt guilty and you're only here. Can I tell you, the first step of devotion is saying, God, I want eternity to enter me. It has to enter you first before you can ever step into it. And that eternity is the Holy Spirit through the, through the price of what Jesus paid on the cross. Will you bow your head? If you want eternity to come into your life, you want Jesus to, to really come and take hold in your life, and, and before we can take the next step, this step has to happen. Just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to invite Jesus in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? There's four or five hands, six hands. Pray this with me, everyone in the room. Father, place your eternity inside of my heart. Let me see differently. Let me hear differently in the name of Jesus. Okay, now I want prayer workers to come and stand up here. If you raise your hands, you're, they're going to come and talk to you. Uh, if you raise your hand, come and talk to the people who are standing in this altar, and they're going to give you a Bible. If you don't have one, they'll make sure you get one. They're going to pray with you. They're going to just talk to you. They're not scary people, so you don't have to worry about it. We put our on scary people in the, in the altar the least scary. They're really nice. Okay. So if you raise your hand, please come and talk to them. But there are others in this room. The problem with this message is you will never comprehend it without the help of the Holy Spirit. This is one of those things you cannot approach this message. You cannot approach this message. You cannot approach it. Follow me. Everyone up here. You cannot approach this message in your own ability, you need the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. So you take your hands and say, God, I need to understand. Holy Spirit, reveal it to me right now. Let me see eternal eternity different than I've ever seen it before. Today, reveal it to me, I pray. Everyone in the room, everyone in the room, just raise your hands, just say, because I'm not afraid of what people think about me right now. I need to hear. I need to hear like receptors wanting to get into the frequency, just saying, God, uh, right now, I need to hear. I need to hear. Will you teach me? what it is to walk and to be devoted to eternity. In your own prayer right now, just begin asking him right now in the name of Jesus.